Let's talk about your uh, fantastic new feature film, One Ranger with Thomas Jane. Uh, you wrote and directed this one. How did the idea for this first come about? I, I loved Coogan's Bluff, which was, as I say, and I, I liked the way they did it with Branigan, with John Wayne going to England, you know, Chicago cop going to England in the 1970s. I thought that was fun. I, I grew up watching McLeod, you know, with Dennis Weaver sitting in my grandfather's lap. Uh, the Fish Out of Water, The Cowboy. I, I find I, I'm English, so I, as I said earlier, we have a love affair with the mythology of the American West with, with the cowboy. But in, in many ways, as much as any... American love affair with that particular era in time. Uh, it represents a freedom that uh, that is quintessentially American and isn't available anywhere else in the world. I don't believe, and and that and 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 that that cowboy, the guy on the horse, if it, if he wants to change town, he gets on his horse, rides to the next town, or if he wants to start a farm, he pitches a fence down. This this you know, it's a mythology, as I say, it wasn't wasn't ever particularly true. <laughs> But but it's there and it's it, it's inescapable and it's an American thing and I I like that and uh, and the amazing thing about the Texas Rangers is their veneration for the past. I worked on a TV show in in Dallas called Walker Texas Ranger for the long, longest time and when I saw you know the statue of one ranger one riot you know the the, the major Bill McDonald you know at the airport the Love Love Field in Dallas uh, they've taken it down now but uh, I was I was very aware of of this and and started digging into it and you know the belt they you know from the gun belt through to the pants through to the boots through the type of you know hat the stetson uh the the badge which is a five peso mexican dollar which has been hammered out and cut to look like a you know star every part of their uniform is 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 a part of western mythology and it's it's enforced they they have a very strict guideline to what they wear and and it has to be and i i find that interesting for someone outside of texas you know now if you're in texas it doesn't mean anything because everyone dresses like that but or, um, a lot of people do but if you're outside of texas in in the modern world and you're seeing someone in cowboy boots and then being told that they're actually a, a member of an elite you know law enforcement uh uh group that are actually you know one of the best at what they do in the world not not in not in that in texas not in america but in the world and what they do they, they are the guys that law enforcement call when they can't deal with certain aspects of of a uh, of a case uh it's even more exciting to know that they still dress in this you know the stetson with the with the hand uh, hammered leather woven belt with requires two belts to wear the gun you know uh, this is cool stuff. This is really interesting. Now, that's all surface stuff. But if you dig even deeper into the mythology of how they were formed and what they did at the beginning of the career, people like Frank Kamer, who caught Bonnie and Clyde, these kind of incredible characters. And it's, and it's you know, there's huge books written on, on legends of, of, the, you know, the, of the Texas Rangers. Uh, I just found it something that we haven't seen in a while. I thought it was an interesting character. As I say, I'm drawn to characters, and I thought, let's let's invest in this character and let's put him somewhere out of water. It was going to be Thailand. We thought about we thought about uh, San Francisco as well, you know, but that was too much. Like, like and thought, it, eventually, England sort of made itself uh, the place to go because I, I I I'm from England and I we, we could put it together and it sort of grew, grew out of that, but it really grew out of the character of uh, Ranger Alex Tyree more than anything else. At what point did the great Thomas Jane come into the picture? Probably about a year into it, the script was written and developed pre-COVID, uh, but Thomas liked the idea of it, you know, uh, and he read it and and it appealed to him. He's a huge fan of uh, Westerns and, and the American West and, and comic books and sort of things that I like. And we got on very, very well. And he thought, he's, he said, I think this would be the one, this would be one we can do, you know. How excited was he about doing the full, full on Texas Southern accent? That was all him, man. He loved it. He he lived in that character. He didn't break character the entire show. So the PAs in England that knocked on his door, they were convinced he, that's how he spoke, you know. His co-star in the film, uh, Dominique Tipper, was cast in uh, a role that was in, incredibly important for the film to work, in my opinion. How did her name first come up for the character? My fear was because you, once you meet Thomas, you realize he's quite intimidating, you know, in his own way. Not, not he's not going to hurt anyone or yell at anyone. But it, but it's he needs to stay, you know, he needs that stimulus the whole time. And I knew we needed someone that was either had some balls, had some had some courage, had some had some you know wherewithal, which is which is tricky because uh, you know you have to work with them, or was someone that he had worked with 
that knew him and knew what what they were getting it themselves in, in into. Uh, and so he he recommended her. I watched some of her work and thought she was marvelous, wonderful. Really, really liked her. Met her in person. Uh, she's just a very, very hardworking, disciplined actress. Uh, the kind that, that that I love working with, and they make you look good as a director. I thought she was great. And and the same for John Malkovich. I mean, whom I love so much, and who brings his gravitas to the film. I mean, I, I believe you've worked with him before, and I think there's a there there's a funny story there, maybe about some lines you rewrote of his. What's the story there? Uh, I I, I love John, and uh, we talk movies and literature and books and things together. I I I just. I just absolutely love being around him. He's he's John Malkovich and talks like John Malkovich and uses grammar and syntax of John Malkovich. It's it's wonderful. It's really really fun. We put him in a little hotel in the north of England, and uh, it was a little smaller than than we'd all expected. They didn't really have big hotels there, so so there was families all over the place, and he'd just walk around as John Malkovich, very 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 aware of. It was through the through the through the restaurant, and you'd see people stop eating and, and look and look at each other and and try and work out if that was who they thought that was. But of course, by then he's already left, uh, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, early on, when I did my first film with him, White Elephant, I had not met him, and we had no kind of relationship whatsoever. Uh, and I made the mistake of uh, making some line adjustments the night before filming, not realizing that his particular method of learning is. It, it happens quite a few weeks prior to filming. And, he, you know, I, as crazy as it sounds, that's that's actually how it works. Uh, and so he had been sent his changed dialogue at 11 o'clock at night. I came home to a very, very interesting and colourful email written in John Malkovich language uh, with a swear word every four words <laughs> telling me that that was not how he worked, that was not how anyone worked with him. And furthermore, it was not going to work this time out. And he'd probably be on a plane back to France to finish his play if this <laughs> problem wasn't sorted out. What the actual, and then a lot more uh, interesting, <laughs> invective. And uh, it's funny because I could, I don't even know what it is, but I could hear it all in his voice. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to quote cadence. some of it, but it's very difficult because I can only quote three or four words at a time. <laughs> yeah before there's a swear word, but it was uh, what the actual, and that was, and then we'll get into it from there. Yeah. Uh, but I kept it and printed it up and I have it on in a little frame in my office because I feel it's a, uh, a reminder to, to check in with the cast the moment they're on board and keep, you know, and uh, cause on, it was one occasion when I hadn't checked in with a cast member, the producers were handling it. I was slammed. I had Bruce Willis that day and, uh, uh, and uh, Michael Rooker and Olga Kurilenko, and we'd done an action scene. So it was, it was. I had my hands full, and I left it to someone else to talk to the actor, which is a cardinal sin. <laughs> and so, uh, at, at roughly midnight, I was reminded of my cardinal sin, and <laughs> hence the framed, uh, printed up email on my wall to remind me never to make to break that particular rule again. Uh, but he's wonderful and, and, and really, really great to work with and, and a trooper all, all, you know, all the way through. Uh, it was a difficult, it was a difficult one for him, this one. And he made it out to the North of England. We were filming in a town called Ipswich, which is one that, you know, most people are, you know, only visit if they're paid to visit. Uh, so it was, I think he, I think he enjoyed the color at all.